welcome everybody who's with us today at our East Campus, our Effingham Campus, our Statesboro Campus, our Midway Campus, those who are downtown at our downtown campus, at the Rockin' Latino Campus across the street. Uh, all of us here at Henderson, welcome, 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 as well as all of you who are watching on computers around the world. Man, we're glad you're with us today. And if you're brand new, for the last few weeks, we've been in a message series that we're calling Dangerous Prayers. Now, after the first message in the series, somebody asked me, Kim, why are you calling prayer dangerous? That doesn't make sense to me. And I think that's a really good question because prayer in itself is not dangerous. It is, in fact, the most dynamic source of help and access to the power of God available on this planet to anybody who is willing to pray. But the reason we're calling them dangerous prayers is that if you learn to pray with a heart that wants what God wants. Now, most of the time we pray it's about God giving me what I want. But if you start praying with a heart where it's, God, what do you want? Then those prayers will lead you to places you ain't never been before. And prayers like that will make you face things about yourself that you've been hiding from forever. And prayers like that will cause you to experience God's strength and make you courageous when everybody around you is scared to death, which is not to say you won't be scared. It's just that, you know, courage is acting on faith even when you are scared. And you pray these kinds of prayers that we're talking about, uh, it'll make you that kind of person. Now, the passage we're mining for the last two or three weeks is Psalm 139. So turn with me in your Bible, if you will, to Psalm 139. It's right in the middle. Uh, man, this is a passage of scripture that David wrote when he was in a super good place with the Lord. Uh, and you will see that his spiritual life was really, really strong all through this psalm. If you didn't bring a Bible, there's a blue Bible on almost all of our campuses. Turn to page 521 and you can track with us through this. But you know, David, David is in uh, what we think of as a thin place. That's what the old Celtic theologians uh, would call it when you were in a spiritual situation where God seemed really close to you. There's just not much between you and the Lord. Uh, and consequently, Psalm 139 is a celebration of the power and the presence of God. So in verse two, David celebrates the omniscience of God. The fact that God knows everything that's happening in your life. Uh, in verse seven, he talks about the omnipresence of God. That God is present everywhere. Where can I go from your presence? Nowhere. He, he, he'll, he'll be there. And then verse 13 talks about the omnipotence of God. You know, that God's power is absolutely inexhaustible. And then David starts thinking about, you not only created the world, you created me in my mother's womb. In fact, you knew and thought about me when I was literally being knit together in my mother's womb. You knew every detail of my life before I was ever born. And so, man, David... His mind is just running through these amazing traits of our awesome Heavenly Father. And then he starts thinking about, man, does my life give that great God the honor that he deserves? And then he begins to pray four potentially life-changing prayers in verses 23 and 24. And I'm going to throw them up on the screen here. Let's read them. Let, let's, let's read this text all together. You ready? Big voice. Here we go. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me. Know my anxious thoughts, point out anything in me that offends you, and then lead me along the path of everlasting life. Now today we're going to talk about this third prayer, this, this test me prayer. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. David is praying, Lord, I want you to look deep into my heart and my mind and see if my faith is being weakened by worry or anxiety. Lord, push me. Test my faith in ways that will make me stronger. And Lord, when you push, if I start to crack or break down and start worrying and, and, and get filled with anxiety, Lord, point that out to me so I can get my mind back on you. Now, it's interesting like, that 10 centuries later, James, the brother of Jesus, would actually write about this in his book. James said, dear brothers and sisters, when troubles of any kind come your way, consider it an opportunity for joy because you know that when your faith is tested, everybody say tested, your endurance, everybody say endurance. endurance. When your faith is tested, your endurance has a chance to grow. So let it grow. I mean, so really a thousand years earlier, David is praying back in Psalm 139, Lord, I know that you will sometimes allow me to go through testing times because those tests can make my faith stronger. And if that's true, then bring it. Lord, test me. Now, you know, there's a lot of us right now who are going through a lot of testing times right now. You've been praying for a long time and you're still waiting for some significant answer to prayer that hasn't been answered yet. And chances are you may be getting a little bit anxious because you haven't seen any results. And if that's you, we're going to unpack a story today that I believe God will use to encourage you. 
in a very, very powerful way. So turn with me in your Bible to, Acts, uh, to Daniel chapter 10. This is eight books to the right. Just eight books to the right to Daniel chapter 10. And uh, just, just find your way over there. If you're feeling really anxious today because you're going through a great testing time, I think this story is just going to blow your mind, all right? Now, this is one of those wild and crazy stories in the Bible that gives us a glimpse of the spiritual world that many of us don't know very much about. So just grab your Bible, track with me. If you've got the blue Bible that we provide for you, it's on page 748, grab that and here we go. Let me give you a little backstory on Daniel chapter 10 before we get into it. Daniel, the guy that this book is written by and about, had three friends named Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And these four guys were super bright Jewish leaders who were captured by the Babylonians as young men when King Nebuchadnezzar sacked the city of Jerusalem and destroyed the Jewish temple and took everything worth taking 500 miles back to Babylon, including Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego as slaves. But when they got to Babylon, they were so bright and the favor of God was so strong on Daniel and his buddies that their influence on the Babylonian society became so profound that he and his buddies literally rose to the top of the Babylonian power structure to the point that Daniel influenced the entire intelligentsia of Babylon that someday in the future, the God of the Hebrews was going to send a miraculous leader who would change the world. They call him the Messiah. And four centuries after Daniel died, wise men from Persia, Babylon, when they saw the star over Bethlehem to mark the birth of Jesus, got on their camels and horses and rode 500 miles to bring precious gifts to this newborn king because of what their culture had learned from Daniel four centuries earlier. But now let's go back to Daniel chapter 10 because at this point, he is about an 80, 80 year old man. He's been praying for Israel since the day Jerusalem fell, you know, so that the Messiah could come and praise God, his prayers are being answered. Man, after all this time, the Persian king decided to let the people of Israel go back to Israel. He's releasing them from captivity, actually funding the reconstruction of the city of Jerusalem and the temple. And if you want to read about that, the book of Ezra and the book of Nehemiah are all about that reconstruction of Israel. And you can read about it if you want to. But in chapter 10, things are not going so good. Daniel is so old that the thought of making that trip all the way back to Israel is unrealistic for him. And that's got to be discouraging to him. He's prayed for this for 60 years and now it's happening and he feels like he's too old to be a part of it. Or maybe he's thinking, you know, I'm wired in here in Babylon and Persia and I know those guys are going to go rebuild the city and I wish I could do that, but maybe I better stay back here and make sure the funding doesn't get cut off, make sure the politics doesn't change. And so though I would love to go that, that way, I'm going to stay here and, and just make sure nothing goes wrong. And then... He gets a, a, a text, say, no, not really a text, but you know, he gets information from the people in Israel saying it's not going very well. Uh, we're facing all kind of opposition over here. These Babylonians that re, you know, repopulated this land hate us. And I mean, Daniel's a big bull level five leader. And he's thinking, by golly, if I was over there, I'd sort this action out. But he's not over there. And these guys, the work on the temple has actually stopped. And he's thinking, oh. And then Daniel has this crazy predictive dream about a cloud of war settling on the Middle East for four centuries. He literally dreams about things that are going to happen in the future. He dreams about the fall of the Persian Empire. And you know this story. Now he's built this, helped build this empire for 60 years and it's going down. You know the story because an American filmmaker made a movie about it, called it The 300, which you should not see, by the way. Anyway, that movie is about 2.6 million Persian troops going up into Greece, meeting the Spartans, trying to get to Athens. The Greeks kicked them out, decimated the army. They came back and crashed. Then Daniel dreams about Alexander the Great rising up in Greece and going all the way around the Mediterranean Sea, conquering the entire world, Egypt, Persia, everything. And then Alexander dies at 30 and he pr predicts that there will be four generals that will rise up and take the empire from there. And then he predicts the rise of the Roman Empire. And then he predicts the Maccabean revolt in Israel in 165 BC, where the Jewish soldiers literally kicked the Romans out of Israel. First time it ever happened in history that they were pushed back from an incursion. And he sees it all. And man, I'm telling you that the, the prophecies in the book of Daniel are so accurate that skeptics have concluded the book is a fraud, that there's no way in the world anybody could have called it that close, that far in advance. So the book had to be written after all those events happened. And then they just lied about it and said it was written back in the days of Daniel. 
until 1946, when the Dead Sea Scrolls were discovered. And there were 400 year old scrolls of the book of Daniel that gave all of those predictions long, long, long before it happened and proved that the book of Daniel is a miracle of biblical predictive prophecy. Now I know I'm, yeah, praise the Lord for that. Amen. <laughs> praise the Lord. That's a big win for our side. <laughs> okay. Now I know I'm geeking out on history here a little bit and I know my boys are watching this. They're laughing right now. Dad, get off it. Right. So let me get back on point. These predictions were not just amazing. They were depressing. They were depressing for Daniel. I mean, think about it. He hadn't written any of this down yet, but he literally sees in detail the destruction of all he holds dear. The Persian Empire, Israel, the rebuilt temple destroyed and defamed by the Romans, you know, 400 years in the future. And I'm telling you, man, anxiety comes down on his heart like an anvil. This revelation tests his faith. He knows that hard times are coming. He knows it because this is from the Lord. This is going to happen. And so here's the question. With all the angst that that creates in his heart, will he serve or will he cave in to anxiety? You ever been in that spot where times got so tough that it's like, do I keep serving the Lord or do I just punk out, lay down, cave? Now, if you're in that spot today, here's what I want you to learn from Daniel. When the test gets so hard that you think you've got nothing left, you can still pray. Amen. You can still pray, man. Listen, Daniel has this vision from God that is so disturbing. I mean, all he sees is more war, more hardship. It's like, Lord, I've been praying about this for decades. I can't take this anymore. And in that depressed moment, Daniel does what all wise godly people do. He sought the Lord in prayer. He thought, Lord, my life's going so bad, I'm going to pray and fast until something happens. And so he starts praying and fasting and it goes for 21 days. He prays and fasts over this thing. Now, if you're new to our church, you know, here at Compassion Christian, every Easter as we're ramping up for Easter Sunday, which is the biggest day of the weekend of our year, we always do 21 days of prayer in anticipation, hoping that God will do something spectacular. And we're going to invite you to be a part of that. We got that idea right here. Look at verse one. In the third year of the reign of King Cyrus of Persia, Daniel, also known as Belteshazzar, had another vision. Now he had a vision in chapter eight, had a vision in chapter nine, and now he's having one in chapter 10. He understood that the vision concerned certain events that were going to happen in the future, times of war and great hardship. When this vision came to me, I, now he's going first person, I, Daniel, had been in mourning for three whole weeks. I mean, he, he fasted and prayed for three weeks about all this. All that time I'd eaten no rich food, no meat, no wine crossed my lips. I used no fragrant lotions until those three weeks had passed. Dude, he didn't even take a bath. He was so focused on praying and fasting and mourning because of the anxiety he was experiencing over these events that he knew were coming that he had no control over. And at the end of that 21 days, God sent him a message. Look at verse four. On the 23rd of April, does that sound like long, long ago in a galaxy far away or once upon a time back in Babylon? No, this is history. On April 23rd, I was standing by the great Tigris River in Babylon and I looked up and I saw a man dressed in linen clothing with a belt of pure gold around his waist. Impressive. His body looked like a precious gem. What? His face flashed like lightning. His eyes flamed like torches. His arms and feet shone like polished bronze. His voice sounded like a vast multitude of people. Dude, what in the world is going on here? Is this some cyborg from Star Wars? Not really. Daniel is getting a message from God that is being delivered by an angel. Everybody say angel. Angel, angel means messenger. Everybody say messenger. messenger. Your pastor is an angel. Everybody say, oh yeah. <laughs> ah, I am an angel in a sense that I am giving you a message from the Lord from his word. But some angels are angelic beings and they come from heaven where God is and they deliver messages on earth to people who are in need. And that's what we're reading about right here. Now, I've told you back at Christmas time, if you prayed for God and he sent you, you prayed to God about something, he sent you an angel, it probably scared a fool out of you. That's what's happening right here. Now, we're not sure who this angelic being is. Some scholars believe this is a Christophany. Everybody say Christophany. Christophany. Okay, that was good. Half of you. Let's go. Come on, man up. Uh, everybody, y'all ready? Christophany. Christophany. Now, you know theology. You're smart. A Christophany is an Old Testament appearance of the pre-incarnate Jesus and scholars believe that because this description sounds almost identical to the description of Jesus in Revelation chapter one. 
Now, let me explain some of the theological language here. Uh, incarnation refers to a spiritual being who puts on a human body, which is what God did when he came to earth as the baby Jesus when he was born in Bethlehem, and we celebrate that at Christmas time. So a Christophany is an appearance of Jesus prior to his birth in Bethlehem, which actually happened a couple of times in the Old Testament. That We'll talk about that another day. I'm not sure that's what's happening here. Now, in chapter 8 and 9, Daniel has two other visions, and when he can't understand them, he prays for help, and God sends an angel to explain it to him. And that angel literally was a messenger from God in heaven to earth, and the angel's name was Gabriel. Anybody ever heard that name before? Yes, there are two angels in the Bible that are named. One is Gabriel. Who's the other one? Michael. Say Gabriel and Michael. Those are the two angels that are named in the Bible. When Jesus is coming into the world, God sent Gabriel to talk to Joseph and Mary and some other folks about the birth of Jesus because Gabriel is God's mailman. Michael is God's hard man. Hard guy. Gabriel provides information Michael brings decimation. So if you see Gabriel, that's a good day. See Michael, that's a bad day. Daniel sees both in chapter 10, all right? Now he says, only I, look at verse seven, only I, Daniel, saw this vision. The men with me saw nothing. And so they suddenly were terrified and they just ran away to hide. So I was left there all alone with this amazing vision. Now this actually happens a few times in the Bible as well. God will send a message to one person in a group and he's the only one that gets it. For example, in Acts chapter 9, when, the, when Saul of Tarsus was going to Damascus to kill and imprison Christ's followers, he was blinded on the road to Damascus by an appearance of the Lord Jesus. Man, it knocked him off his horse. Paul, he's with a crew of guys. They don't see a thing. And so Saul has this life-changing encounter with God, with Jesus, and the rest of the guys didn't get a thing. Now, now here's the point. When your faith is being tested and, dude, you pray. God will often reveal something special to you that he doesn't reveal to other people. I saw this happen on Thursday. Uh, I was at a board meeting at Point University. I'm sitting by my buddy uh, who's an elder at Passion City Church in Atlanta, Georgia. He is also a big bull real estate guy who has done over $2 billion worth of business in the real estate business, right? So he is a monster in the marketplace, but he loves the Lord. And he was just lit up that morning about Psalm 84. Cam, you, I'm going to show you what the Lord showed me this morning. He pulls his phone out, gets it, gets it on the U version, gets it Psalm 84. Look at this verse. Look at this verse. I just love, look at this verse. Oh, this is so awesome. Look at this verse. And I'm like, mm-hmm. Yeah, cool. Good. Right. Did not hit me the way it hit him. All right. Now, listen, when you walk with the Lord, that's the way it works sometimes. Man, if you're being tested and I mean you're being pushed to the limit and you're crying out to God and then you come to a worship service like this or you read a passage or you hear a song and boom, you get hit. It's like awesome, man, that song. Take courage. Hold on to hope. That's what I needed to hear today. This is, and you crying, man, and you look around. What's wrong with y'all? Then y'all hear the song over here. And you know what? It didn't hit them the way it hit you because they're not in the same place you are. Maybe they're not seeking the Lord the way you're seeking the Lord. Maybe they're not as desperate for God as you are. But you can be sure of this. When you get into a flat space in your spiritual life or maybe you start declining or you get pushed and tested and something happens that tests your faith and that causes you to start praying and seeking and knocking and longing to hear from the Lord. When you get to that spot, you will hear from the Lord. You will hear from the Lord. Look what happened to Daniel. He said, my strength left me. Now, when he saw this guy, it was like, what? His strength left him. His faith grew deathly pale. I felt very weak. Then I heard the man speak. And when I heard the sound of his voice, I fainted, passed out, bam, face down on the ground. Now, friends, when you seek the Lord and he shows up, you may have moments where you feel overwhelmed by the presence of God. And I'm praying that some of you will have that experience between now and Easter. You may have never had it before, but I'm praying some of you will have that experience between now and Easter. And if your heart is open, good chance that you will. I've had an overwhelming sense of God's call on my life a number of times. The first time was when I was sitting in church. I was a very religious young man. I've been to church every weekend of my life. I went to church the first day when I was four days old, every Sunday since. And I was sitting in that church, listening to a sermon when I realized that I was a sinner on my way to hell. I knew who Jesus was. I've been to church a lot, but religion is not the same thing as a relationship with Christ. And I realized I had religion, but I did not have a relationship with Christ and I was doomed 
And so I told somebody. And they said, well, Cam, you ought to ask Christ to be the leader of your life and the forgiver of your sins. And I'm like, how do you do that? And they taught me how to pray. And I asked Jesus to save me. I asked him to forgive me of my sins. Then I confessed my sins before my church. I was baptized into Christ. It was a life-changing moment for me. Happened again five years later when I was at church camp. Uh, the same camp I was telling you about a couple of weeks ago. I was in high school. Man, it was awesome. We were having fun. We were playing sports. We were having a great time. There was a lot of good-looking women. Wait a minute. That's not my notes there, but... <laughs> That was a confession. <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> I was having a good time, all right? But I met some guys from Point University, and their faith was red hot. I mean, these guys were jacked up about their relationship. I mean, they were handsome. I mean, the good women were good looking. They, they were athletes. They were fun. They were bright. But they loved the Lord. I mean, wide open, no, no shame. They loved the Lord. And when I looked at them, <laughs> and I thought about the lukewarm backsliding, peer pressure, compromised faith that I had compared to that. Dude, it was embarrassing. It was embarrassing. And I mean, I'm watching these guys day after day after day looking for a crack, and there ain't no cracks, man. And I remember one night, we had a great day, great day. Got into bed, I couldn't go to sleep. I was just consumed with this, this you know, disparity between you know, what that faith looked like and the sorry faith I had. And so I got out of bed. I went to a quiet, private place that I could take you to in South Carolina today. Take us three hours to get there on a motorcycle, but I could take you there today. And I got down on the floor and I prayed. I said, God, I am sorry. I am sorry that I have cared more about what my peers think than what you think. I am sorry that I have put lesser things before you. I'm sorry, Lord. I know my life is not honoring you when I live like this. I know I got to do more than this. And man, I was on the ground praying and it was like the Lord spoke to me. Now, I did not hear any voices. If you hear voices, call me. I'll take you to Charter Hospital, all right? <laughs> but I'm telling you, in my heart, it was as if God said to me, Cam, if you ever want your life to be of any use in any significant way, I'm gonna have to have all of it. And I wasn't thinking about the ministry back then. I was thinking about being a lawyer. I mean, all I was thinking was BMW. That's all I was thinking about, right? <laughs> but I mean, I got hit. And he said, Cam, if you want me to use your life in a significant way, I need all of it. And before I got off that ground, <laughs> I told the Lord, you got me. You got, you got it all. I'm all in, all yours. And friends, that's how it's been to this day. Now, I've not been unperfect, and I would never pretend to be. But I've been all in since that day. When he asked me to sacrifice, I sacrificed. When he asked me to go somewhere, I went. I don't care what my mama thought about it, what anybody else thought about it. If God said go, I'm going. When God said stay, I have stayed. No matter what other people thought, no matter how much better it might look on the other side of the fence, if God said stay, stay. When he said risk it, I've risked it. Risk the friendship by telling a hard truth. Done. Risk your job by leading the way I called you to lead. Done. Risk your future by doing what I tell you. Done. You know, every time over the last 30 something years at this church that we've attempted any big project, any big challenge, there's always been a moment where I'm riding in my truck thinking, Lord, if you don't sh show up, I'm gonna look like the biggest fool in this city. Lord, they're gonna run me out of the city. And like Daniel, almost faintly, I have limped up to that line and then taken that next step of faith and watched God work over and over and over and over again. And as God is my witness, I could never have dreamed up a life as good as the Lord has given me because I have prayed, test me. And he has done it and done it and done it and led me in the way of everlasting life. And I believe that's going to happen for somebody here today. Not everybody. But it's going to happen for somebody today. You know, this week, we got hundreds of church leaders coming here for our Next Level Conference, which is a church leadership conference. And many, many, many of you have already signed up to serve as volunteers as usual. And I just thank God for you because every time we do the Next Level Conference, the thing that gets the highest rating is our volunteers. I mean, I'm going to teach my guts out. Everybody on our staff is going to do the same thing. But what's going to impress people the most is you. Uh, I mean, our, the spirit, the vibe of our volunteers. Listen, I met an elder of a church up in Atlanta, you know, a couple years ago at a funeral. And I said, hey, I'm Cam Huxford. He said, I know who you are. I've been to the next level. I was like, great. He said, it was awesome. It changed my life. I said, how? 
He said, well, you know, I'm an elder in this church. He's some old big football player. He said, I've been handing out bulletins at the door, you know, just handing them out like this, some half-hearted effort. And I went to a workshop with a little lady that hands out programs at your church. And dude, she said, we are the first line of offense. Man, when somebody comes in that door, this is my chance to show them the love of Jesus. I'm going to give them that bulletin. I'm going to say good morning. I'm going to smile at them. I'm going to light them up if I can because they're getting ready to meet the Lord. He said, that woman embarrassed me to death. He said, here I've been some, you know, big lug handing out bulletins like it ain't nothing. And some little lady in your church lit me up. And I was like, what? You know what you met? You met a normal, compassion Christian. Can I get an amen? amen? That's how we roll around here, y'all. And listen, praise the Lord. Many of the folks who come to this conference are going to hear from the Lord this week. This week. The theme of our conference this week is what if? And God is going to call many of them to ask that question. What if I was bolder? What if I worked harder? What if I prayed more, dreamed more, gave more, loved more, served more, invested more of my heart and soul and mind and strength? He's asking some of y'all that question right now. Amen? Amen. Not everybody, but some of y'all getting this message right now. And God is going to communicate to some in ways he will not communicate to others because some of us want it more than others. Just like Daniel. All right, we haven't even got to the good part of this story yet about those who are being tested by anxiety, so I'm going to have to pick it up. Here we go, y'all. You ready? Buckle up. Daniel's going to teach us to remember what's real. Remember what's real. Everybody say real. You got to remember what's real when you're going through a time of testing. Man, you got to be able to differentiate between fear and faith because faith is what helps you remember that God cares for you more than you do. Say it with me, everybody. God cares about you more than you do. Listen, man, when our fears rise up and worry and anxiety try to choke us out, dude, if we turn to the Lord like Daniel did, we will realize something about God when we're tempted to for, that we're tempted to forget in testing times. And that is that God cares more about us than we do. Look at verse 10. Just and remember, Daniel's seen this angel and he's passed out. I mean, he's face down on the floor, right? And just then a hand touches me and lifted me up, still trembling to my hands and knees. Don't miss this, friends. When we're being tempted, sometimes we think it's because God doesn't love us no more. God doesn't care about me no more. But the truth is God loves you, cares for you. He is there for you. He is going to send help for you. I mean, look at, look at this. Daniel is so weak, he can't stand. And God sends a hand to lift him up. And then the man said to me, now imagine what's happening here. This, this angel has got this passed out dude on the floor and he's picked him up to his hands and knees and he's looking Daniel in the eye and he says, Daniel, you are very precious to God. Say it with me, everybody. Daniel, you are very precious to God. That's why I don't think this is a Christophany. If that was Jesus, he would have said, Daniel, you are very precious to me. But what he said was, Daniel, say it with me. Daniel, you are very precious to God. I believe God sent that angel from heaven to encourage his servant when they were down. And for some of you, God has heard your prayers. And he led you to church today to hear this line. You are very precious to God. You are. You know, on Wednesday night, we're going to have hundreds of next level folks here. And I'm telling you, every time we host this conference, there are pastors and leaders who come to this conference on their last leg. They have been pushed farther than they think they can stand. They have been tested beyond what they think they can bear. They are going to quit the ministry if something doesn't happen at this conference. And sister, if that's you here today, I want to remind you that you are very precious to God. Say it with me, y'all. I, no, say it first person. I am very precious to God. Now, I'm going to talk on Friday at the last session of the next level. And one of the things I'm going to talk about is some of the times I wanted to quit. What if I'd quit? What if I quit before I led my sons to Jesus? What would my family look like today? What if I quit before I led my buddy Michael to Christ last October? Friends, the only time I have ever gotten that discouraged is when I've forgotten who I came to Savannah for and how he feels about me. I came to this city because I believe God called me here. And he called me here because I am very precious to him. Precious means valuable. Dude, God called me and he's calling you because you are very valuable to him. I don't care what you've done in the last year. I don't care how far you've slidden off the path. Dude, you have not done anything that changes the way our God feels about you. He's crazy about you. I know it's hard to believe, but he is. He values you. 
He knows everything about you and he's still crazy about you. Now let me tell you something about my wife. She is very precious to me. And if you don't like my wife, me and you ain't never going to be friends. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> we ain't going to be friends, but if you don't like Sarah, that ain't going to happen. My sons, my daughters, my grandchildren, they are precious to me. I value them. And friend, if you have given your life to Jesus, you are a child of God and you are very precious to him, valuable to him. You are a valuable part of his family. God looks at you the same way any healthy parent looks at their children that they would gladly die for. You are valuable to him. He cares about you more than you even care about yourself. So don't ever let circumstances cause you to forget that. Dude, when you get in a testing time, don't lean away from the Lord because you're being tested. Lean into him because you know his word says that you are valuable to him. And if you're here today and you forgot that, he sent an angel to remind you. That's me, by the way. Right. Not from heaven, from South Carolina, which is almost the same thing, all right? <laughs> that laughter is coming from people who've actually been to South Carolina. <laughs> now, Daniel's just writing down. He's just writing down everything he remembers, right? So, so listen, here's what the angel tells him. So listen carefully, bro. Listen carefully to what I have to say to you. Stand up. I've been sent to you. Dude, you prayed. God heard. Spiritual forces have been sent here to help you. That's why I'm here. And when he said that, I stood up. I was still trembling, but I stood up. Man, when Daniel realized that God had sent an angel from heaven to help him out, even though he was still trembling, he found the courage in that knowledge and, and, and focusing on what's real, even in that testing time to stand strong. So here's what you need to remember when you're being really tested. First of all, God cares more about you than you do. You're tempted, tempted to forget that. Don't forget that. Number two, and I love this, God is doing more than you can see. Say it with me, everybody. God is doing more than you can see. He's doing way, way more than you can see. All right, buckle up now. This is where Daniel pulls back the curtain on reality. If you're a Star Wars fan, this is going to be better. Matter of fact, some SCAD student here needs to make a movie out of this. You need to make a movie out of Daniel chapter 10. It's awesome. Look at verse 12. Gabriel said, don't be afraid, Daniel, since the first day. Everybody say first day. First day. Since the first day you prayed for understanding and to humble yourself before God, your request was heard in heaven when? Say it with me, everybody. The first day, first time you prayed about it, your request was heard in heaven and I have come in answer to that prayer. Hang on now, y'all, because we're getting ready to go supernatural, all right? For 21 days, the spirit prince of the kingdom of Persia blocked my way. And then Michael, one of the archangels came. Now think about this. There is a demonic presence trying to foul up whatever God was doing in Persia and when Gabriel left heaven to come and answer Daniel's prayer, the prince of Persia fought him over that. And they fought and fought and fought for 21 days. I mean, Gabriel hammered that joker for 21 days, couldn't get by. And God said, that's it. You get my schedule off, Michael. And man, <laughs> Michael's like, got this. Shoot. And then he jumps off the bulkhead of heaven, right? And then all of a sudden, Daniel sees him, I mean, Gabriel sees him coming and Michael's like, I got this, bro, go, go. And that old demonic presence is like, oh, this is gonna hurt. And it sure is, he tore that joker up. It's so bad it didn't even put it in the Bible. Didn't even put it in the Bible, what happened. <laughs> <coughs> but, but Michael comes, takes over the battle. Gabriel leaves and he says in verse 14, now I'm here to explain what will happen to your people in the future. This vision concerns a time yet to come. Now, if you've been praying for something for a long time, and that has tested your faith. And man, as a matter of fact, you're thinking about giving up. You're being overcome by anxiety. You think about quitting because surely if God cared, he would have done something a long, long time ago. Obviously, I'm just wasting my breath on this prayer. This passage should remind you that the first time, everybody say first time. First time. The first time you prayed, God heard your prayer and help was on the way. First time you prayed for healing for that person you love, God heard your prayer. First time you prayed for your child, begged God to do a miracle, God heard that prayer. First time you prayed, your loving Father in heaven heard your prayer. And listen, our God loves persistent, faithful prayer from, listen to me, educated sons and daughters who know because of the scripture that the answer to your prayer is dependent on a number of things. Look at verse 13. 
for 21 days. God sent that answer. And for 21 days, demonic interference stopped the answer from arriving to Daniel. For 21 days, the spirit prince of Persia blocked my way. Now, who is the spirit prince of Persia? We don't know for sure. But most scholars believe, and I totally agree with this, that it is a demonic force. You may remember that long before the earth was created, there was a rebellion in heaven. A third of the angels were cast out. They're called fallen angels now. The devil was the leader of that thing. Man, we believe that those demonic forces are still alive in the spiritual world, trying to block what God is doing in his world today. Now you say, Cam, come on, bro. You don't still believe in that. Hey, you tell me why in World War II, in the most best educated country in the world, Six million Jews are murdered by their neighbors in an act of, act of ethnic cleansing. And at the same time, in the Ukraine, Joe Stalin kills nine million Ukrainians, and you never even heard about it. In 1994, in Rwanda, which was supposed to be the most Christianized nation in Africa, 800,000 Rwandans are killed by their neighbors with no technology in 100 days, hacked to death with hatchets and hoes. Why is it that Christians are literally being crucified and, and killed in the Middle East today. And you don't hear a word about it on the news. Dude, our government's sitting there with their arms folded. Every other government in the world is doing the same thing. Why? Well, it should be obvious to those of us who've read the Bible. Paul said, put on the full armor of God so that you will be able to stand against the strategies of the devil. Because we're not fighting against flesh and blood. It ain't about Democrats and Republicans and Asians and Europeans and Americans. No, no. Our fight is against the we're not against flesh and blood enemies, but against evil rulers and authorities of an unseen world, against mighty powers of a dark world, and against the evil spirits in the heavenly places. And that prince of Persia was one of those evil spirits in the heavenly, in spiritual places. And you can be sure there's a prince of Georgia as well who's trying to thwart what God is trying to do in our church, in our state, in your prayers. And we're going to fight him. Now, a lot of churches don't want to hear about this. A lot of people are like, oh, Lord, Kim, sh man, I've, gone, I've been to graduate school. Don't talk to me about demons. I, I get it. What, what was the movie line? Best trick the devil ever pulled was convince people he didn't exist. You, you, know what, you know what Daniel wants you to know? What you can see with your eyes is not all there is. What you can see with your eyes is not all there is. Gabriel told Daniel that there was a territorial demonic spirit that battled him for 21 days. And then God sent Michael to sort it out. And he did. And Daniel went on to complete his mission. And he's there in front of, Dan uh, Gabriel went on to complete his mission, standing in front of, of Daniel in an answer to prayers that Daniel prayed 21 days ago. Now think about this. Daniel prayed and prayed and prayed and prayed for week after week. And what did he see? Nothing. Didn't see a thing. But just because Daniel didn't see anything did not mean that God wasn't doing anything. And friends, if you're here today and you are overcome by anxiety to the point that you're finally ready to pray, the first time you cry out to God, he heard your prayer and released some force to help you. And you may, that, that answer may be doing warfare right now on your behalf in ways that you can't see and will never be able to understand. Listen, when I came to our church, our church was stuck. And it was stuck because of specific reasons, problems that needed to be solved, that if I tried to solve them, I would have been released to pursue another destiny. <laughs> and so I started praying in 1984 and my prayer was miraculously, dramatically, specifically answered in 1994. Ten years later, miraculous answer. 3,650 days after I started praying that prayer. So if you've been praying for a long time, stand up, keep praying. Keep believing. The fact that you don't see anything yet does not mean that God is not waging war on your behalf behind the scenes to do things for you that you cannot see and wouldn't understand if you did see them. But he's doing it because you are very precious to him. You know, Mickey Batwell sent me an email back in August about something that happened 10 years ago at our church. And it was a single mom. She came to our church. This lady got a ride to our church and she sat down to talk with Mickey Batwell, one of our elders, and when they sat down and talked, she got so emotional that she wept for 30 minutes before she could get a word. I mean, snorting, weeping, tears flying all over the place. Uh, unconsolable for 30 minutes before she could even get out. 
uh, what her problem was. And, and Mickey just sat there with her. She finally composed herself and she said her husband had left her with two special needs children that he could not afford to have a family and do what he wanted to do, so he just abandoned the family. That man had abused her verbally. He had abused his family physically. She was in a shelter for abused women, no transportation, no food. Somebody said, you ought to call Compassion Christian Church because that's the church that helps people. And so she came when she composed herself. She told me that story and she said, would you please pray for me? And he's like, oh yeah, yes, I will. I'll pray for you and against that jerk. But anyway, I, I, yeah. And so Mickey prayed with her and then he connected her to our community care ministry and they got her some food from our lighthouse ministry and they got her some counsel from Life Change Counseling Center and we did all we could do to help her through that time. Now, ironically, 14 days after Mickey prayed with her, a family from our church brought a used minivan here to the church and donated it to the church. Now, this is what happens. A lot of members in our church, if they don't need their trade-in value on their car, they'll just donate it to the church and then we'll have some of our mechanics fix it up for free and then we'll give it to somebody in need. And that's what happened. Somebody brought a minivan by, left it here to church, our mechanics went through it and then three weeks after Mickey had prayed for her, he asked her to come back to the church because we had something for her. And so she gets her grandmama to bring her back to the church and he says, I got it out in the parking lot. So they walk out of the parking lot, he unlocks this minivan, lights come on, doors unlock, opens it up, there ain't nothing in there. She looks at him like, what? And in front of her grandmother and her kids, he hand her the keys to that minivan and said, this is yours. And she about passed out. About passed out, man. But what's interesting is that she got those keys 21 days, exactly, after she and Mickey prayed for God to rescue her from this testing time. And that van encouraged her. But that answer to prayer also empowered her. And she got a job so that she could support her family. And she worked like a dog to be able to take care of her kids. And on that job, God led her to a godly man that she fell in love with. And they both got married as followers of Jesus. And, and they worked here in our church for a long time. Then they moved to Charleston a few years ago where they found another great church. And 10 years after that answer to her prayer, she emails Mickey back here and says, you're not going to believe what happened in church last weekend. Our church announced that they're going to start a ministry to single moms where we're going to change the oil in their cars and, and we're going to work on their cars for free. And when, she, when they said that, I looked at my husband, he looked at me, we bust out laughing and said, that's our ministry. We finally get to give back. Did I mention that she married an auto mechanic? <laughs> <laughs> I'm telling you, man. I, don't you want to thank God? Let's thank God, man. Thank God. For a faithful mom who looked to the Lord when anxiety was eating her up. Amen? But for 21 days, 21 days, nothing. Could have been 121 days. Could have been 1,121 days. Could have been like me, 3,650 days. But on day one, help was on the way. Amen? Amen. Help was on the way, man. Look how this story ends. Then the one who looked like a man touched me and I felt my strength returning. He said to me, Daniel, don't be afraid. Why? For you are very precious to God. Say it with me, everybody. You are very precious to God. He says it a second time. He wants Daniel to remember when you feel overwhelmed, don't forget what's real. I know what fear will tell you, but don't forget what's real. You are a child of God. You are the precious child of the most high God. You are very valuable to him. So remember that and be at peace. Be encouraged because you know what's real. Be strong in the Lord, not your own strength. You know you don't have the strength, but he does. And as he spoke these words to me, I suddenly felt stronger. I've seen this so many times in our church. It's one of the blessings of being in the ministry is seeing people who are going through hell turn to the Lord and suddenly feel stronger, feel at peace. Because peace in the place of anxiety is a gift that God gives to those who pray relentlessly when they're being tested. Father, I just pray in these few moments, Lord, that there will be those who are being tested today. They're being pushed, pushed farther than they thought they could stand. I pray, God, that rather than turn to worry, rather than turn to anxiety, rather than get mad and cuss and fuss and all that, the Lord, they'll do what Daniel did. They'll start to pray and fast and fix their eyes on you, trusting, Lord, that you will hear and you will send help. And it may take a while to get here, but we will trust you until it does. 
And we pray this in the strong name of Jesus. And all God's people said, amen. amen.